What's up, Ninja Nerds? In this video today, we're gonna to be talking about cardiomyopathies within our clinical medicine section. If you guys like this video, you benefit from it, please support us. And the best way that you guys can do that is by hitting that like button, commenting down in the comment section, and also subscribing. Another way that you can help us is go down in the description box below. We got a link to our website. At our website, we have a lot of other things that we can offer for you. Great notes, great illustrations to follow along with during these lectures, as well as we're developing courses on those who are preparing for the step one, the step two, the pants. Go check that out. Also, we got some merchandise that we actually sell there, so go check that out as well. All right, let's talk about cardiomyopathies. So cardiomyopathy is a disease process pretty much of the myocardium. That's really what it is. And there's three types. There's dilated, hypertrophic, and restrictive. What we have to understand is, is what is the pathophysiological difference between these three. When we talk about dilated, and thus within the name, it's pretty straightforward. They're very dilated ventricles. But what causes the ventricular dilation? We'll talk about that in a second. But the concept, the pathophysiological concept, is that there is some disease process that's causing the contractility to go down. And we'll go over those causes. Now when the contractility of the heart goes down, what your body tries to do is it tries to compensate, right? Because you guys know that whenever you drop your contractility, what do you do to your cardiac output? You guys know this, right? Eventually it'll drop your ejection fraction, you may drop your cardiac output. So when cardiac output drops, what does that do to your blood pressure? It drops your blood pressure. How does your body compensate for the drop in blood pressure? It increases your systemic vascular resistance. If you increase your systemic vascular resistance on your veins, you're gonna squeeze the heck out of those veins and I'm gonna try to push more blood into the heart. What does that do to the heart? Loads it with fluid. So now you make it super preloaded, right? And if I increase preload, that sounds like that may be a beneficial thing, but if the heart's weak and it can barely get blood out, now you're gonna load it up even more. And when it does that, it has to compensate. And so what it does is, it dilates. And whenever this ventricle dilates, over time it thins the myocardium, makes it even more weak. And you know what that does? When you stimulate this dilation process, what this will do is, is this will lead to a drop in the ejection fraction. And these patients often develop what's called systolic heart failure. Another term that we use is what's called HEF REF. Heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction where it usually drops less than 40%. And this is usually the concept that you'll see here with dilated cardiomyopathy. Now, the question is, is this dilation, well, how does it occur? We talk about this in cardiac pathology, but just a quick little terminology that I want you guys to be aware of is we use this term, it's what's called eccentric eccentric hypertrophy. And what does that mean? That means that you're adding these particular sarcomeres in a series process, and that's what really is triggering this dilation process. That's really what the dilation is. Now let's actually ask ourselves the question. Okay, we're dilating the ventricles because of reduction in contractility. What is causing this reduction in contractility? In other words, why are these ventricles all jacked up for whatever reason? causing these things to be gargantuous? That's the question. So let's actually remember, there's a quick little mnemonic because there's a lot of causes. And the mnemonic here, or a little kind of helpful trick is, A, B, triple C, D. And then we'll add on two more, unfortunately, after that. But A is for alcohol. B is for beriberi, which is thymine deficiency. C is for cocaine toxicity. The other C is for Chagas disease, which is a, a nasty little protozoa, right? We call that Trypanosoma cruzi. The other C is going to be very interesting. This is usually probably, say, one of the more common causes of the virus. It's called Coxsackie B virus. And the last one here is actually a very common chemotherapeutic agent that we use, and it's called doxorubicin. All right, so these are some of the offending agents and exactly the mechanism, how they cause a reduction in contractility, we don't completely know, but they do tend to do that. There's two other ones that I really don't want you to forget as well. They don't have an easy mnemonic, I just want you to add them onto your mind. And these other two are gonna be what's called Takatsubo, and the other one is Peripartum. I think the peripartum one is a giveaway for itself. It's a patient who is usually somewhere around the actual pregnancy process of either getting ready to give birth or they've just given birth. 
Takatsubo is usually something that happens when there is a generalized massive stress on the body. Emotional, physical, sometimes you can see this in patients who develop like intracranial hemorrhages for some reason, but it's a massive sympathetic storm. But all I want you to know is that all of these particular factors here, what are they doing? They're reducing the contractility, which is leading to this dilated cardiomyopathy. Okay, my friends, that covers dilated cardiomyopathy. So we have an understanding of this process. Now let's move on to the next one. You have this patient here, and look at this, look at this chunky sucker, look at this. That ventricle septum is thick, all right? Why is it? We'll talk about that in a second, but the primary process that is occurring in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is in the name, it's hypertrophy. But most of the time, it's asymmetric and it usually involves the septum. So we're gonna say this is what's called septal hypertrophy. When you have this septal hypertrophy right here, right? What does this do? All right, it's super interesting because I'd say it actually does kind of two things if you want to think about it. One is it makes it almost impossible sometimes to get blood out of the heart, right? So here, let's X this off where it makes it hard to get blood out of the heart. We call this a left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. This is the left ventricular outflow tract, which is the blood trying to get out into the aorta. That's completely obstructed by this big old chunky septum. That's one really big thing. The second thing is, look at the space. Look at how much it's crowding out that left ventricular space. It's gonna be almost impossible to get blood into the ventricle as well. So there's going to be some type of impaired filling process. So there's going to be a decrease in the filling process. But at no point in this disease process does it reduce the contractility. It just impairs filling and makes it a little bit harder to get the blood out. This, my friends, is an example of what's called a heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction. So sometimes this can be in the category of what's called a HEF, PEF. Heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction where it's greater than 40%. And so this is something that I want you guys to think about. And we'll go over these in a little bit more detail when we get into the complications. But that's the basic concept of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. But the question usually comes here is, why is there, so this was dilation. This is septal hypertrophy. And they're both hypertrophy, you'll notice, right? So why is this one completely different? Well, if you guys remember from pathology, the way you add the sarcomeres in the septum is usually kind of like on top of one another, in parallel. And we call that what? Concentric hypertrophy. So that's that big patho pathology difference there. Okay, question then arises, what causes the septal hypertrophy? And believe it or not, it's usually a genetic mutation. If it's pretty much the septum, not generalized left ventricular hypertrophy, because left ventricular hypertrophy can be generated from hypertension, aortic stenosis, anything that really increases the afterload. In true asymmetric septal hypertrophy, it's usually a genetic mutation. And so in this particular scenario, I want you to remember that this is the heavy chain myosin gene mutation. Oh, that's actually kind of nice because this is HCM hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So that really kind of helps me a little bit to remember this whole process. So this is a mutation of some sort, generally involving the heavy chain of myosin. That's the concept I want you to understand about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. All right, last one here, my friends, is restrictive cardiomyopathy. This one actually tends to be kind of the, the interesting one, super rare. If you had to go from most common to least common, it goes dilated, then it goes hypertrophic, then it goes restrictive. All right, so most common to least common. Now, with that being said, what happens here? Well, you'll notice that there's not much of a difference here in the look of it. There's no dilation, there's no septal hypertrophy. What happens is there's an infiltrative process. So some kind of like substances deposit into the ventricles. And when it does that, it makes these ventricles super rigid and kind of like fibrotic, if you want to think about it like that. So now, naturally, muscle wants to stretch and distend. This infiltrative tissue does not want to stretch or distend. And so that's the big concept, is there is some type of myocardial infiltration. And this will reduce the filling process. So this is the concept that I want you to understand. You get myocardial infiltration, 
And what do you do to the filling process? You make it very, very difficult. Why? Because blood wants to come into these ventricles, right? And they will come in. Blood will come into the ventricles. But what will happen is it'll fill kind of like relatively quickly and then it'll stop because the ventricle will allow for some filling, but then it doesn't stretch. It has no give because of this infiltrative process. So because of that, it's kind of similar to this one, and then it's, there's no reduction in contractility. The contractility is generally, for the most part, preserved, but it's really hard to fill it. That sounds like a half pef. So usually in these patients, they have what's called half pef, for the most part, where it's greater than 40% for their ejection fraction. And that's the big kind of difference here. Now, you'll notice there's no hypertrophy here of any type, no concentric, no eccentric hypertrophy. It is an infiltrative process into the myocardium. So we don't need any other pathological terms to go here. But the question is, is what is infiltrating, right? That's the cause. That's what we got to think about. And generally for this one, it's three particular things that I want you to remember. By far, the most common is going to be amyloidosis. So here, let's write the infiltrative disease. These are usually infiltrative diseases. And by far, the most common one that I want you guys to remember here, there's going to be three of them. Bop, bop, bop. First one is going to be amyloidosis. This is going to be by far the most common. The second one is going to be hemochromatosis. And the third one is going to be sarcoidosis. These are generally going to be the infiltrative processes that lead to this reduction in ventricular filling. All right, so now we have a good understanding, my friends, of the different types of cardiomyopathy when it comes to the pathophysiological differences. So now what I need to do is, like, okay, let's take these cardiomyopathies and say, why are they dangerous? What's the complications or issues that arise? All right, my friends, so off to the complications or the problems that arise whenever a patient has cardiomyopathy. So let's go through each one of these. So dilated cardiomyopathy, that sucker is huge. Big ventricles due to the redux reduction in contractility. What happens with this one is they primarily present with biventricular failure. So left and right heart failure. This is actually, should be pretty simple. When a patient has left heart failure, what happens is in this particular scenario, their cardiac output stinks. So their forward flow, especially since this is systolic dysfunction, is actually going to be not very good. And so what happens is it's hard for them to be able to get blood out of their heart because of the reduction in cardiac output. Because there is a reduction in cardiac output, what happens then is the blood will actually start to back up because the pressure in the left side of the heart is gonna be high. And that'll transmit to the left atrium, and then that'll transmit to the pulmonary vessels, then to the pulmonary capillaries. Do you remember what that pressure is that usually rises? The pulmonary capillary wedge pressure will rise. When the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure rises, what that leads to is something very interesting. So the pressure in the capillaries are so high that it actually causes the hydrostatic pressure to increase and push fluid out into this interstitial space. So now you have all this fluid that accumulates in the interstitial space and then into the alveoli. What is this called? Pulmonary edema. Now, pulmonary edema may be a finding that you have on chest x-ray, but it can also be potentially evident in the way that these patients present symptomatically. So one of the ways that pulmonary edema may present is you may have a patient who whenever they lie down flat when they're sleeping or whenever they're lying down flat in general, they have shortness of breath. And the reason why is that fluid may kind of layer out where it's normally at the, the basilar portions or the actual bases, now it's gonna spread out through the entire lung and worsen the actual shortness of breath. So we call this paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, which is when they're sleeping and lying flat, they have shortness of breath, or when they're just laying flat orthopnea. So these are the two types of features that you may see as a result of pulmonary edema. The other one is that the patient may just have generalized dyspnea. So dyspnea is shortness of breath that they may experience when they're at rest or when they're exerting themselves. Depends upon the severity. But these are the features that you'll see here. That would be the left heart failure problems. Now, the right heart failure is actually relatively simple. The right heart fails Again, because there's a difficult time being able to generate enough cardiac output to push blood in this particular scenario out of the right heart. So that cardiac output stinks. If the cardiac output stinks, where does the blood backflow? Into the right atrium. So the right atrial pressures will rise. 
When the right atrial pressure rises, we use a very particular terminology because then this right atrial pressure gets transmitted into the cava, into the inferior vena cava and the superior vena cava. Do you guys know what this terminology is called? It's called a CVP. So when the central venous pressure rises, what this does is, is this causes fluid to back up into the superior vena cava. When it backs up into the superior vena cava, this will then back up into the jugular veins and plump those suckers up. What is that called? Jugular venous distension. That's one potential feature. The other thing is it backs up into the inferior vena cava, plumps up the liver and causes hepatic congestion. When you cause this vessel here, where you can't get blood out of this dang thing, so you get it all congested, it causes injury to the liver. And this can cause hepatomegaly and potentially even liver failure, like cirrhosis. So you may see as a result of this, hepatic congestion, which we can sometimes call hepatomegaly, and that can potentially progress to liver failure. So that's one potential way that this CVP being high can cause problems. Another way is it can go down into the actual lower extremities and cause edema of the lower extremities. Sometimes when you push into it, it actually kind of creates a little divot. We call that pitting edema. And the last potential feature here that I actually want you guys to remember is sometimes the portal venous pressure becomes super, super high. And the portal veins, whenever they get ballooned up, they start leaking fluid into the peritoneal cavity. So if your portal hypertension ensues, then what this does is this causes fluid to leak into the actual peritoneal cavity. And look at this, when you get fluid into this peritoneal, peritoneal cavity, it causes this big old belly to accumulate. And this is called ascites. So it's a portal hypertension related ascites. These are potential features that you may see in anybody who has right heart failure, but the cause of the right heart failure may be dilated cardiomyopathy. All right, we move on. So right heart, left heart failure, we can also call that biventricular failure, is very prominent in patients who have dilated cardiomyopathy. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a little bit interesting. So remember that thing I told you where they have what's called a left ventricular outflow tract obstruction? So it's this septum, it's kind of bulging out. Let's make it even more bulgy. We're gonna bulge this puppy out. It's gonna be really hard to get blood out of this thing. So now look, it's almost impossible to get blood out of the left ventricular outflow tract. So because of that, they're gonna get poor systemic perfusion, right? If the patient is really like dehydrated or they're working out and they're really increasing their contractility and their heart rate, this creates a really significant problem. So what happens is they get a decrease in systemic perfusion. But usually this is really, really bad in certain states. And what I mean is, in a, if a patient is really dehydrated, so if they have a very low blood volume or their heart rate is really high, then what happens is, so if their blood volume's low, their heart rate's very high, these particular problems will really, really make it even worse because you have less fluid here. That means less blood even getting out. If the heart rate is beating crazy fast, that means it's gonna be harder for the actual heart to fill properly. And then on top of that, if you increase contractility, that'll also do it. So here, we'll put in like a little increase and I'll put in CON, but just remember that stands for contractility. I'll put CONT, all right? All of these things are gonna worsen that systemic perfusion. If it's bad enough where the heart's beating really fast, they're hypovolemic, and their heart rate's really, really high, you don't perfuse particular tissues. And the two tissues that I want you to know is the brain, and oftentimes, this perfusion is so low that it causes a transient loss of consciousness. And this is called syncope. So this is one potential feature that I want you guys to remember, all right? Syncope is one. Another one <clears throat> is that you can decrease the perfusion to the heart. And that's actually terrifying because now, let's say that I have a portion here of the heart that's becoming ischemic. So if that ischemia starts to arise, what's the actual con common clinical manifestation of patients who have ischemic heart disease? Angina. So they may develop angina due to the actual myocardial ischemia due to poor systemic perfusion. So that's one potential feature. The more scary feature is sometimes this can be enough ischemia to the heart if they are very hypovolemic, super tachycardic, high contractility, that it actually can cause the patient to go into VTAC or VFib. So sometimes this is enough to cause the patient to go into VTAC, VFib, and sometimes these patients will even go into sudden cardiac arrest. 
And so this is a very common clinical manifestation. Usually the clinical vignettes will present a young, kind of like maybe a 15, 20 year old person who's out on the football field running around, they're dehydrated, they're increasing the heart rate, they're increasing contractility, and all of a sudden they syncopize or they have some type of cardiac event. That is a very common feature here. Now, this is all due to low cardiac output, right? I'm having very little blood getting out of the heart. But on top of that, sometimes it's hard to be able to get blood out of the heart and that backs up into the left atrium and then increases the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure and causes fluid to back up into the interstitial spaces. And this is called pulmonary edema. So the patient may also develop pulmonary edema. And oftentimes this is very mild and these patients will present with the finding of dyspnea. They'll present with the finding of dyspnea, okay? So with that being said, there's a couple findings, but oftentimes we use like a little trick to remember this. I'm gonna kind of put a box around them. It's SAD, syncope, angina, and dyspnea are the common findings of a left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. Worst case scenario is some type of fatal arrhythmia where they go into sudden cardiac arrest. All right, the last one here for the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is the murmur. This left ventricular outflow tract obstruction can create a problematic murmur, meaning whenever you auscultate, right, whenever you're auscultating and listening to the heart, generally we say that like dilated cardiomyopathy can have an S4 heart, I'm sorry, S3 heart sound. Left ventricular outflow tract obstruction murmurs are very weird. When you listen to them, it will actually present kind of like a very weird systolic murmur. It's kind of like a whole systolic murmur. It has a crescendo, decrescendo pattern to it. We'll talk about this more in the murmurs lecture. But what I want you to know is some kind of differences. Whenever you're actually reading the vignette, you can pick out which one it is. So the interesting thing about this particular murmur is, <clears throat> I want you to think about two scenarios. One when the patient is like very preload, they have very little preload, all right? So we're gonna have two scenarios here. In this scenario where you see the ventricle is really, really small, really, really small in this particular scenario, what happens is the obstruction gets worse. What would be something that would cause the ventricle to be very, very small? One is they would have a very low preload, all right? So if they have a very low preload, that means they're not gonna fill the ventricle very well. So it'll be a lot smaller. Another thing is if you have a decrease in the afterload. So if I have a decrease in the afterload, what does that mean? That means there's less pressure in the order and I can push a ton of blood out. That means that there'll be very little blood remaining in the ventricles. So a decrease in preload and a decrease in afterload oftentimes will make this obstruction worse. And what it'll do is it'll increase the intensity of the murmur. Now this may seem like, okay, well what in the heck would actually reduce preload and what would reduce afterload? You would reduce preload by doing what? Maybe if you have the patient kind of like do what? You have them stand up. And whenever they stand up, generally it kind of like actually reduces the venous return to the heart. That would be one mechanism. Or another one is you can have them Valsava. And if you Valsava, you kind of like actually help to decrease the venous return in that way as well. So these would be mechanisms that would reduce the preload. Reducing after though, we don't have any technical mechanisms, but again, that would also, you can give like a drug called amyl nitrate, very short acting, and that can also increase the intensity of the murmur. But this is the basic concept I want you to understand here. All right, and this one, super like, kind of like very compacted ventricle, that makes the obstruction worse, and that's gonna intensify the murmur. This one, the ventricle's big. It's a lot bigger. And so because of that, it reduces the outflow tract obstruction, and that's gonna make the intensity of the murmur decrease. So what would be some particular things that would do this? It's the exact opposite, it's not hard. So it's going to be an increase in preload and an increase in afterload. What are things that would increase preload? You have them squat down. When you squat, you actually squeeze more blood up to the right heart. The other thing is afterload. If you have them squeeze kind of like hand grips, that would also increase the afterload. And it would make it what? Harder for blood to leave the heart, so more of it would stay in there. These are things that would actually do what? Decrease the intensity of the murmur. That covers hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. So we have the sad features, cardiac arrhythmia, and the murmur. Think about whenever it's small ventricle, big ventricle, and the maneuvers that you do for that. Restrictive cardiomyopathy, the least common one. Let's blow through this puppy here, right? You have all this kind of like myocardial infiltrative process. And this myocardial infiltrative process is gonna reduce filling. If it reduces filling, it's gonna to lead to a heart failure process. 
And what's going to happen is it's more commonly going to affect the right heart than it does the left heart. That's interesting, right? So it's going to have more kind of like effect on the right heart than it does the left heart. So this filling process is actually going to be inhibited. And so because of that, the blood will back up here into the inferior vena cava and back up here into the superior vena cava. What do we say it would increase? The central venous pressure, central venous pressure. And if you increase the central venous pressure, this should be a quick reminder here of all of these. We'll blow through these. In the superior vena cava, plumps up the jugular veins, you should get JVD. If it's in the inferior vena cava, it should cause the liver to get plump, cause hepatomegaly, maybe even liver failure, plump up the legs, cause pitting edema, and plump up the belly due to the portal pressures and cause ascites. Let's write that down. All right, my friends. So that would cover the right heart failure, which is again, the primary manifestation of restrictive cardiomyopathy. Remember, dilated can cause both. Restrictive, primarily right heart failure. There's one other common feature that really helps us to distinguish patients who have restrictive cardiomyopathy from other types. And this is called the Kussmaul sign. Very, very interesting. So here we have this infiltrative process in the myocardium, right? And this infiltrative process in the myocardium makes it hard for the ventricles to be able to fill, particularly the right. Remember I told you the right heart is more commonly affected than the left heart in restrictive cardiomyopathy. Well, what happens is, let's say here you fill the ventricle whenever you actually go through what's called a diastole. So this is the process whenever your heart's supposed to be filling with blood. What happens is you take a breath in. When you normally inspire, it should actually drop the intrathoracic pressure and suck blood into the right heart. So naturally, blood should help to move right here. But what's the disease process in restrictive cardiomyopathy? Reduce filling. If you reduce filling, it won't be able to do that. And what happens is the blood will actually stay in this kind of cava and cause it to plump up even during the inspiratory process, which is super weird. So we say in Kussmaul sign, there is a paradoxical, it shouldn't happen, a paradoxical increase in the jugular venous pressure during what? Inspiration. There is a paradoxical increase in the jugular venous pressure during inspiration. And why? Because it's restricting the filling process. It's a hard myocardium and it won't allow the myocardium to stretch during inspiration. That's a key feature. So at this point, we've covered the cardiomyopathies. We got down these complications. Let's figure out how to diagnose them. Hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy is really important. You have to be able to identify this murmur and know how to evaluate it, what to do to change the murmur's intensity via decreasing or increasing. So look for that classic crescendo decrescendo murmur. You see how it rises up, rises down between systole, usually the left sternal border. You may hear an S4 heart sound, you may hear that systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve, SAM, which causes the mitral regurgitation. Big thing here is, I want you to know what increases the intensity of the murmur. So if I do this and I have the patient try to valzava or stand, what this does is this reduces the amount of blood flow coming into the heart. If I reduce the amount of blood flow coming into the heart, this will then cause the, what happens is if there's less blood flow, the septal hypertrophy will kind of increase and then it'll bulge into the actual, uh, the outflow tract here more. Look, see how it's kind of like bulging out more? That's the problem. So again, you reduce the patient's preload. You don't stretch out that LV as much and you increase the outflow tract obstruction. Same concept here. If I decrease the afterload, now the pressure in the aorta is actually going to be lower. It's gonna be easier for blood to leave the actual left ventricle. That leaves less blood in the actual left ventricle. And if there's less blood left in the left ventricle, then you decrease the stretch and you increase the outflow tract obstruction. So it's either, again, you're not filling it enough because you're not loading it, or you're causing a lot to leave and then leaving very little left. That's the concept. So you decrease venous return and decrease afterload. That will increase the intensity of the murmur. Now do the opposite here. You decrease the murmur intensity. It's going to be the exact opposite scenario. You're going to increase the venous return. Squat or lay down flat or lift their legs up. What that does is it increases their preload, fills their left ventricle more, stretches out that actual bulge here. Look at the bulge. It's not there as much because you're stretching it out. And that decreases the LVOTO. If you increase the afterload, you make the pressure in the aorta higher, you squeeze hand grips, 
it makes less blood leave the ventricle. If you leave less blood leaving the ventricle, it stretches the left ventricle out more and relieves that outflow tract obstruction and that decreases the murmur intensity. So remember, decreasing venous return, decrease afterload, increases the murmur, increase venous return, increase afterload, decreases the murmur intensity. That's super key to remember. All right, we got an idea now of the different types of cardiomyopathy, the, car the causes, the pathophysiology, the issues. We even know how to evaluate the HCM murmur. How do we approach these all now in differentiation? If you see biventricular failure, if you see S3, what do you think about? Dilated cardiomyopathy. If you see right heart failure, small sign, restrictive cardiomyopathy. You see SAD symptoms, syncope, angina, dyspnea. You hear a holosystolic murmur, which is the LVOTO with the different changes in murmur intensity, increasing with decreasing venous return and, and increased afterload. And then uh, decreasing murmur intensity with increased venous return, right? And decreased afterload. Then you think about HCM. Now, once you have these, the way that you can truly differentiate them is an echocardiogram. An echocardiogram will give you an idea. Is there big dilated ventricles? And is there a reduction in contractility, systolic dysfunction? That suggests dilated cardiomyopathy. Go looking for the A, B, triple C, D causes. Is there an LVOTO, septal hypertrophy? Is there diastolic dysfunction? Does this look like HCM? Lastly, is there biatrial enlargement preserved ejection fraction, but diastolic dysfunction because the ventricles are super rigid. You think about RCM. Now, you want to be able to differentiate restrictive cardiomyopathy from constrictive pericarditis on your exam. They will try to mess with you on this. What you want to look for in comparing these side by side is physical exam. They will both have a small sign. One of the big differences though is constrictive pericarditis, which we'll talk about later, has what's called a pericardial knock. Restrictive cardiomyopathy does not. Echocardiogram, constrictive pericarditis will have a thick pericardium, a septal bounce, and an abrupt reduction of ventricular filling. But the echo on restrictive cardiomyopathy should be biotrial enlargement and diastolic dysfunction. The next thing is cardiac CT or MRI. It'll show a thick pericardium, but for restrictive, a normal pericardium. And last thing here, sometimes they can do a cardiac catheterization, and they can look at the actual in diastolic pressures. And what you'll notice is, without getting too crazy, is that I want you to think about this. Constrictive pericarditis involves the entire pericardium. Restrictive cardiomyopathy usually hits the muscle, and so it usually it loves to hit the septum too. The septum moves a little bit with the ventricular filling process, but if the septum is thick, it won't be able to move as much and change the end diastolic pressures. So what happens is, there's concordance of end diastolic pressures because the septum is not moving and restrictive cardiomyopathy. In constrictive pericarditis, there's discordance because that septum can move. And if it moves, it can alter the end diastolic pressures in both of the ventricles. That's the concept to understand between these two. Just a quick chart for you guys to think about when you're actually having the exam and you have to try to differentiate between these two. All right, we got a diagnostic approach. How do we treat these? It's so straightforward. Dilated and restrictive cardiomyopathy will present like heart failure. And so you treat them like heart failure, which we, again, understand is what? Reducing their sympathetic nervous system activity. I do that with beta blockers and SGLT2 inhibitors. I reduce their RAS activity, and I can use things like ACE inhibitors, ARBs, or I can use ARNIs and aldosterone antagonists. I can increase their BMP activity, which would be via ARNIs. And I could decrease venous congestion symptoms through things like diuretics, restricting sodium and, and fluid intake. All right. But here's the big one that you'll probably test it on more when it comes to the cardiomyopathies for treatment. It's hypertrophic. Here's what I want you to think about. We treat these patients by trying to reduce the LVOTO. And you have to go back to the murmurs. Which one decreased the murmur intensity is the things that you want to do. I want to increase venous return because it stretches out the left ventricle and flattens the septal hypertrophy. Keep these patients hydrated, avoid any diuretics, and avoid excessive exercises that really dehydrates them, okay? That's really key. The other thing is I need to increase afterload because it keeps more blood present in the actual left ventricle, which will stretch out the LV and stretch out that septal hypertrophy.
So in this scenario, I have to avoid vasodilators. Don't give them ACE inhibitors, ARBs, hydralazine, amlodipine, anything like that because it can actually cause their obstruction to be worse, which seems odd, right? The other thing is I have to decrease contractility. When you cause the ventricles to contract, it'll actually bring the septum inwards into the outflow tract and obstruct it more. Things that decrease contractility is beta blockers and calcium channel blockers. That's going to be key. But you know what else? Avoiding vigorous and crazy exercises. Oftentimes, so what they'll present in the actual clinical vignette is a young child who's playing sports, they end up having a syncopal event or they have a, a cardiac arrhythmia and they want to go back and play football or do whatever sport they can. You can't because what happens is they can get dehydrated, reducing their venous return, and they increase their afterload usually with exertion and they increase their contractility. All of these things can worsen their murmur intensity, worsen their LVOTO, and then put them into a deadly cardiac arrhythmia. With that being said, if a patient does develop a cardiac arrhythmia, you do not want them to develop another one. And so oftentimes what we will do is, is we will implant in what's called an AICD, which will help to be able to detect them being in an abnormal rhythm and shock them back out of it. Lastly, if the patient is refractory to all of these methods, what we can sometimes do is, is we can cut the actual outflow tract obstruction. You can do something called a myectomy, where you literally, a myectomy, which you cut out that actual disease portion, or you actually use a catheter and you take and you run some alcohol through that catheter and into this area and you ablate the actual area there. And that's the ways that we can do this. But that covers cardiomyopathy. All right, my friends, I hope that you guys enjoyed that. I hope it made sense. I really hope that it helped. And as always, until next time.